Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone attending this webinar. And welcome to this session on the global and regional implications of COVID-19 on e-commerce and digital trade. It is organized by a few members of the E-Trade for All initiative, notably ANCTA, the regional commissions for the UN for Africa, Europe, Latin America and the Caribbean, and Western Asia, as well as by ITC, and we are happy to have the Inter-American Development Bank on board for this session as well. And as you know, the pandemic has accelerated digital transformations in many ways. Like us today, many people and businesses have turned to digital solutions during the pandemic to continue some economic and social activities. And one aspect of the implications brought by the pandemic has been a surge in e-commerce and digital trade. At the same time, we know that the ability to take advantage of such digital opportunities varies a lot across countries. And it was against this background that a group of e-trade for all partners halfway into the pandemic decided to join forces to try to study the implications of COVID-19 on e-commerce. This is in fact the first collective research oriented effort that we have undertaken under E-Trade for All. And this global review that we are gonna to discuss today was released only last week. And this session offers a targeted dialogue to discuss the main findings of both developments at the global level and at the regional levels. We will hear about barriers that countries and businesses have been facing when trying to leverage digital solutions. We will look at some policy responses that have been taken. And not least important, we will have some reflections on how to reap more synergies and scale up global support to those countries that are the least equipped to manage digital transformation. Uh, a few words about how we structure this session. Uh, to start with, Ms. Shamika Sirimane, the director of ANCTAD's Division on Technology and Logistics, will set the scene by presenting some of the main global findings of the research. Uh, her intervention will be followed by brief uh, interventions by uh, representatives from various regions on the implications of COVID-19 on e-commerce and digital trade. We will then have an interactive debate with the panelists to try to dig a little bit deeper into some of the quiz questions, such as what kind of policies and strategies that are needed to help e-commerce play a more positive role for long-term response and recovery, and also how to mitigate the risk that developing countries, and especially the least developed countries, will be left further behind as a result of this rapid digital transformation that is currently taking place. And during this uh, session, we also hope to be able to take a few questions from the audience. I would like to encourage everyone attending the session to take an active part in the dialogue. Feel free to use the chat function to share any information that may be relevant and make comments during the session. And if you would like to pose a specific question to any of the speakers, please use the Q&A, the question and answer function. After the panel discussion, we will read out a few of the questions to allow speakers to respond. I will ask for your understanding if we are unable to address all questions within the time allotted, but I would encourage those of you who would like to post questions to try to target them to specific panelists so we can uh, efficiently allocate the responsibility for providing good answers. With that, I would like to wish you a good session and hand over to uh, Director Sirimane or Shamika for her opening remarks. Shamika, you have the floor. Thank you, Toby. And so let me uh, share the screen and get my PowerPoint up. So bear with me for a few minutes, a few seconds, hopefully. Okay, I think you have it, right? Okay, yes, uh, a very big welcome to all of you uh, out there and uh, and I'm very happy to uh, uh, to share 
the main findings of the global review of the impact of COVID-19 on e-commerce. And as Tobin mentioned, this is conducted by UNCTAD and E-Trade for All partners. And I'm very happy to see regional commissions and our regional partners in this panel. And so you will hear a lot more from them from their own regional perspectives. So e-commerce is playing a very uh, a growing uh, role as part of the wider digital economy. Uh, it provides new ways of facilitating the sustainable development goals by bringing both new opportunities and also new challenges uh, to the world. And uh, digital technologies are increasingly affecting how goods and services are produced, consumed and exchanged. And you know, last year we have, we have seen uh, how important the digital economy has become. So basically the, this pandemic has reinforced the importance of addressing existing barriers and benefiting from this emerging digital economy. So this pandemic has plunged the world into the worst recession since World War II. In 2020, the global economy shrank by 4.3%, and these are our new uh, estimates. And this is a much bigger a slump than during the 2008-2009 global financial crisis. And lockdowns and other preventive measures that governments have put in place uh, to basically to stop the spread of the virus have disrupted economic activities in ways for which uh, I mean, we were simply not prepared. So these lockdowns became the new normal and uh, businesses and consumers increasingly went digital and providing and purchasing more goods and services online. You see on the screen, the share of e-commerce of global retail trade is estimated to have gone up from 14% in 2019 to about 17% in 2020. Honestly, and I think this is an underestimation probably because there's no data, you know, there's no consistently collecting data on e-commerce. Businesses and consumers that were able to go digital have helped mitigate the economic downturn caused by the pandemic, but they have also sped up a digital transformation that will have lasting impacts on our daily lives and on our societies for which not everyone is prepared, probably hardly everyone is prepared. Countries that harness the potential of e-commerce will be better placed to benefit from global markets for their goods and services in this emerging digital world. And while those that fall to, fail to do so, risk falling behind even further. And this has been a very big concern at ANTA that we have been talking about this lamenting uh, for, for, for a long time now. So let me now talk you, take, take you, kind of gives a glimpse of the regional trends. And our report shows the strong uptake in e-commerce across all regions. Latin America's online marketplace, Mercado Libre, for example, sold twice as many articles per day in the second quarter of 2020 compared with the same period the previous year. And take uh, Jumia, and this is the African e-commerce platform, reported a 50% jump in transaction during the first six months of 2020. And there are lots of such numbers and stories in the report. And we will also hear from our partners and when they present the regional perspectives and how the regional trends have, have moved. And consumers in emerging economies have made the greatest shift to online shopping and 50% of them are expected to continue doing shopping online more often than before. So the transformation has already happened. The pandemic has also benefited the world's leading digital platforms and most solutions being used for e-commerce, teleworking and cloud computing are provided by a relatively small number of very large companies based mainly in China and the United States. And I, you know the stories that we see on uh, news, how these platforms have got richer and richer. 
uh, during this uh, the pandemic. And in many of the least worst, least developed countries, consumers and businesses were not able to capitalize on the new e-commerce opportunities due to persistent bottlenecks and barriers such as lack of connectivity, only half the world is connected, costly broadband services, even, when you're, even if you're connected, over-reliance on cash, lack of consumer trust on online transactions, poor digital skills, uh, and government's limited attention to e-commerce. And so the list goes on. Those gaps are also reflected in our e-trade readiness assessments. And uh, this is a spin-off from the E-Trade for All initiative. And we have done 27 of E-Trade readiness assessments uh, and so far, and you know, many in uh, LDCs. The risk is that the huge digital divides that already existed between and within countries will only worsen in the wake of this pandemic. The result will be even deeper inequalities that would threaten to derail progress made on, uh, and, and on the SDGs and development gains that countries have made along the path. The COVID-19 pandemic has made it even more urgent to ensure that countries that are trailing behind are able to catch up. So let me take you very quickly through the policy responses. There are a lot, lot of policy responses and recommendations, but I'll just come to the, you know, to the, just to the crux. So as the shift to the digital economy has been accelerated by the pandemic, the report sees the need for greater efforts by three main stakeholders to secure more inclusive benefits from e-commerce. First, for governments. Governments need to prioritize national digital readiness so that more local businesses can become producers in the digital economy and not just consumers. Building and enabling e-commerce ecosystem requires changes in public policy and business practices to improve the digital infrastructure, facilitate digital payments, and establish appropriate legal and regulatory frameworks for online transactions and security. So the approach must be holistic. And we say that there should be a whole of government approaches and we simply cannot afford to have a silo approach to digital transformation, ICT ministry doing one thing, trade ministry doing something else, industry doing totally different things. And I don't think this would work. It has to be a whole of government approach and with a vision uh, to create, you know, to go towards uh, emerging digital economy. The second is the digital entrepreneurship and there are recommendations in the report. The digital entrepreneurship must become a central focus of efforts to capture value in the digital economy. This requires faster digitalization for smaller businesses, especially more attention to digital entrepreneurship, especially reskilling the workforce, better capabilities to capture and harness data and the strong regulatory frameworks to build trust. And then third, the international community, including development partners, you know, us in the UN system, and the regional economic communities, regional bank, and organizations uh, concerned with digital development needs to find new, bold, and smart ways to work with governments and private sector to leverage these opportunities. So international community also have to have a whole of uh, international community approach. We also cannot be running around doing small projects you know, without any connection, without connecting the dots, and it would not work. So only through active collaboration can we ensure e-commerce plays a powerful and positive role in national and international efforts to build back better. This pandemic has also demonstrated the importance of ensuring consistency and avoiding duplication in international efforts. Uh, over the past four years, the E-Trade for All initiative has shown the potential for collaboration and adding value and uh, especially, in develop, uh, especially in developing countries and especially among the developing countries in LDCs. 
So in concluding, let me say that the E-Trade for All initiative will continue to play its part by advocating for relevant policy approaches, supporting assessments of national e-commerce environments, and fostering collaborations between national and international stakeholders to maximize the synergies that can contribute to enabling e-commerce for development. And of course, our work will not have been uh, possible without generous financial support of our donors, uh, especially uh, Estonia, Germany, and Netherlands. So let me also thank them. And let me thank you all. So Toby, and let me stop here. And I'm really looking forward to the rest of the discussion, especially the regional perspectives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amika, for an excellent presentation. Uh, I, um, uh, you heard uh, that uh, Shamika was making reference to the need to connect the dots, which is kind of the tagline for E-Trade for All. And the, the efforts that we are talking about here today are really uh, a collective effort. And I'm therefore very happy and proud to have together with us today, uh, several representatives of uh, some of our partners that have been contributing very actively to the overall research effort and that have produced also dedicated reports for uh, specific regions. Uh, and uh, I will uh, uh, introduce uh, the speakers as we, uh, we take one by one. And I would like to start by uh, turning now to, uh, to Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, and in this case, we have actually had two organizations that have contributed to the work, both the Inter-American Development Bank who, uh, which is represented today by uh, Sandra Corsuera Santa Maria, excuse my pronunciation, and Mr. Nanum Mulder from ECLAC. Uh, so I would like to pass over the, the uh, floor to, to Sandra to start with. And now we will get uh, uh, your perspective, yours and Nano's perspectives from Latin America uh, on the main impacts that you have seen and maybe some lessons learned already. So over to you, Sandra. Thank you very much and good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening to, to everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, many thanks to ICLAC for uh, joining our forces with the IBB to work on this, uh, on this report in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, so uh, just to start, the pandemic has hit uh, severely uh, to the Latin America uh, Caribbean uh, countries. A few indicators, uh, GDP per capita uh, uh, went back to uh, 2010. Uh, the level of poverty uh, has increased dramatically and 37% of the population is right now um, living in poverty. So trade is going to be uh, key for uh, economic uh, reactivation and uh, e-commerce as a new channel of trade is becoming uh, very, very relevant. So just a few reflections uh, to set the, the stage about uh, what happened in, in Latin America uh, during the, the pandemic. Well, first of all, I will say that uh, uh, the evidence suggests that uh, e-commerce and digital trade uh, penetration jump years forward uh, during uh, 2020. And some examples of these are that 173% uh, of uh, increase in households buying uh, online. Uh, also uh, the, the credit card use uh, uh, was uh, five times uh, higher uh, in May than it was in, in February. And the average searches in the internet uh, for uh, in websites, um, for e-commerce also increased around uh, 157%. And all of this happened in a region which is lagging behind uh, in preparedness for uh, e-commerce. Just uh, for, uh, to corroborate this, uh, this, uh, this uh, data, uh, Latin America share uh, of global e-commerce is marginal, only 2% at the moment. The second point I would like to, to, to highlight is that the um, available data uh, indicates that the response was stronger in domestic uh, e-commerce and not so much in uh, cross-border e-commerce. And this is because uh, the disruptions in, in the travel 
uh, uh, in transport modes, especially in air, that reduce the capacity for uh, uh, small shipments uh, in, in the region. So in, in, in postal service was uh, more affected than express because they don't have their own, their own fleet. No? However, evidence shows that um, one year later, uh, e-commerce is uh, already picking up to higher levels than it was uh, um, at the beginning of uh, 2020. So this is very good uh, news. We believe that there are um, uh, promising opportunities for expansion of e-commerce in the region, both in goods and services, uh, but the region has to address some uh, barriers and bottlenecks uh, first, uh, which are related to uh, connectivity, regulatory frameworks, uh, trade facilitation, digital skills, and others. Um, Nano is going to go uh, further in, uh, in, the, in the responses uh, of, uh, of, of the region to many of, the, of these challenges. But I just want to point out to one of them, which is trade facilitation. Uh, the pandemic fostered uh, enormous uh, change and transformation in customs and border agencies, which trans translated in regulatory simplification, in le higher levels of automation, in um, a better coordination at, at the border, no? but um, we, we need to, do, uh, to undergo structural reforms uh, um, in order to reap the benefits of, of e-commerce. No? Better uh, risk management, um, application of new technologies, uh, regional uh, coordination and integration. No? So just to, fi to finalize, uh, the IDV, the Inter-American Development Bank, is working uh, closely both at national and regional level uh, with countries in order for, for them to um, assist them uh, to unlock uh, greater economic growth through e-commerce and also insertion in regional and global value chains. So that's, that will be uh, the perspective, and Nano is going to go into further detail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. Please, Nano. Thanks, Sandra. I also appreciate and I'm very grateful for the collaboration with the IDB on the regional report, which will be launched in a couple of weeks. In my short intervention, I would like to add some additional information on the basis of a survey undertaken by ECLAC on initiatives and policy responses to foster e-commerce and digital trade amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. This survey was answered by 18 out of 33 governments in the region. And I would like to, let, to make uh, five points uh, in terms of the uh, policies implemented. First, by the time of COVID-19 pandemic hit, when it hit the region, half of the surveyed countries indicated they had a national strategy to promote e-commerce in place. Of the other half, three countries indicated they launched a new strategy. The breadth and the maturity of national strategies seem to vary substantially across countries. And also in many countries, strategies to develop e-commerce are framed within wider digitalization strategies. Second, e-readiness the, is the policy dimension with the highest level of engagement, both in terms of the number of initiatives as well as regarding variety and creativity. Almost two thirds of countries implemented some form of training programs to repurpose economic activities towards e-commerce. And the other half of the countries introduced a dedicated website with information and recommendations to support SMEs in improving their online presence and digital transformation. Less frequently were actions oriented towards women entrepreneurs. Third, Relatively few cases were identified of countries that introduced new policies to strengthen businesses involved in cross-border e-commerce and digital trade operations, both in goods and services. Two cases that are interesting to mention is one of uh, the Dominican Republic that, did, uh, that introduced the B2B platform productive linkages. And another case is Costa Rica, which established a public-private partnership with different marketplaces to support the presence of SMEs in these international platforms. Fourth, measures to increase connectivities in underserved areas were among the most popular initiatives in the regions. So two thirds of the countries implemented policies to make progress towards universal access to digital connectivity. To ensure this connectivity of both businesses and consumers, most countries in the regions declared internet and mobile services 
as essentials and, uh, and strategic services. And often we, uh, tariffs were reduced, the rates to uh, access these services or people uh, in some cases even had free access to uh, internet. And finally, only 11% of the countries implemented initiatives regarding to the regulatory environment and legal framework to enable digital trade. These countries put in place modifications or clarifications to personal data protections and privacy related regulations or modifications to cybersecurity regulatory framework. About half of the countries indicated that actions nevertheless were in progress in these areas. One notable example is Brazil that uh, introduced most measures in the regulatory framework. Thanks. Uh, this is the contribution from uh, Latin America to this um, small dialogue. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Nano. And there will be more time. We'll have uh, more time to interact also in the in the continuation of this session. And uh, I uh, I would like uh, to express a, a special thanks actually to to Eklak uh, because you were the ones who actually came up with a brilliant idea to do this together. And you have done. A, I know you have prepared. An, extremely good report, which will be coming out uh, soon to, uh, to everyone to look at. Um, uh, maybe I also would like to recognize here, when, when we do these kind of major reports, of course, we're not doing this all alone, but we have a number of great uh, uh, consultants helping us in this context. And I know uh, Bernardo Diaz de Astarloa was very important for the ECLAC report and for the global report, of course, David Suter and Henri uh, van der Spuy were playing a very important role and uh, I believe that uh, we will hear about the other regions uh, very shortly. So let me now turn to the next uh, region uh, on our list here is uh, um, Economic Commission for Africa. And with us today, we have Mr. Jamie MacLeod, who is the trade policy expert in Addis Ababa. So um, I pass over the floor to you, Jamie. Thank you very much, uh, Torbjorn, and uh, let me also thank uh, Angtad uh, sincerely for this initiative. Honestly, it has been a tremendous pleasure to be part of this, and uh, it's, it, I would say it's one of my favorite initiatives on e-commerce that we have uh, been involved in uh, in EC. It's been great to learn from what's been happening in the different regions to synthesize kind of results. And you know, often you can see something happening in Latin America brings out something that we might have uh, underappreciated in our own region. Um, I thank you very much as well for the opportunity to share our results from our own region. Uh, I should say in doing this that uh, we benefited tremendously, as you're saying, with the, the support of consultants, in our case from uh, Guy Futi, uh, the co-author of the study, and benefiting tremendously from him being an entrepreneur in this area in Africa himself, a former MD at Jumia, uh, and also a general manager at Ironco. Um, uh, our, our study, uh, you know, we used a mixed method approach. We involved lots of uh, interviews with some of the leading tech entrepreneurs across the African continent. And as well as that, try to corroborate that with some of the high frequency data in this area, um, particularly, you know, uh, financial statements from different relevant uh, companies. Uh, so what did all this tell us about what was the impact of COVID-19 on uh, e-commerce in Africa? Uh, I think, the kind of overarching result is a really mixed picture, actually. The, on the one hand, uh, we have seen many of the pressures that we're seeing elsewhere that accelerated uh, uh, e-commerce uh, through the impact of, of COVID, you know, things like accelerated consumer path digitalization and the adoption of new technologies. But in the African context, there was a real uh, fundamental uh, lack of some of the foundations there for the digital economy. So Jamika mentioned in her opening remarks, that only half the world currently has uh, is online. In the African context, that's only 30%. And in many countries, much less than that, you know, 10% of the population. Moreover, the digital economy is very concentrated in the central leading urban areas. So in Nairobi, where I'm joining this from, for instance, Uber only works in, uh, in two cities in the country, in, in Kenya, in Nairobi and in Mombasa. Most of the rest, or the rest of the country is left out from that kind of part of the economy. Um, but also one way of unpacking this kind of um, mixed picture overarching story uh, helps to look at the two different types of e-commerce. And uh, actually this distinction draws from some of Unktad's earlier work, I think the Information Technology uh, Economy Report uh, 2019, where they uh, distinguished between um, e-commerce involving uh, physical delivery of goods and services, which purchased online, things like uh, ride hailing apps, 
uh, or physical goods delivery purchased online. And in that kind of market, uh, the picture was uh, overall very mixed. Um, so for instance, uh, Jumia in their financial statement in the fourth quarter of last year, they, they say, uh, while 2020 has been a, a challenging year operationally with COVID-19 related to supply and logistics disruptions, it has been transformative one for our economic model overall. So particularly they'll talk about in the first, uh, when the lockdowns were happening, really struggling with, um, with their logistics, with their supply chains, with moving physical goods. And this we would see and hear from all the entrepreneurs we spoke to. Uh, then you could come to the second form of an e-commerce business, that involving the transmission of electronic goods and services. And there you'd see a bit more of a positive picture uh, because they would be unconstrained by lockdowns. Uh, and one uh, tech entrepreneur in uh, uh, Kenya that we spoke to um, who is involved in online content creation, particularly with a large US uh, market, saw a five-fold increase in, in her revenues. So a, a kind of different story depending on the type of e-commerce we are thinking about. Um, what also has been interesting has been the, the government's actions and responses to this across the continent. Uh, one uh, insight I'd like to pull out from our report was from uh, Desiree Lomu from the ECAS, the Central African Regional Commission, uh, who said that the digital economy was not at all seen as a priority before COVID-19 to policymakers. But COVID-19 showed them that uh, there were these big infrastructural deficits based across the region and that the co countries that did not have proper internet infrastructure struggled more. So that was one of the big uh, kind of common le lessons we, we, we discovered is this greater appreciation of the digital economy has actually been quite significant and, and mattering. And some of the specific actions we've seen uh, and have been impressed by uh, in response to that include things like, and, and this is one I've drawn as being a trade expert myself, uh, but safe trade measures uh, involving cross-border trade in African countries, um, which have been invoked across the continent uh, very well in the East Africa region. And whilst these go beyond just digital uh, measures, um, that's including things like health services at borders and tracking of uh, lorry drivers, they also include far greater automation of border processes um, to, to reduce physical interaction and also greater adoption and encouragement of digital payment options. Um, so a nice, a really nice kind of uh, phenomenon that uh, we, we hope will, will remain uh, there uh, uh, after the, the, the COVID pandemic has subsided in these regions. But also we've seen some, um, some measures or movements in policy that can be considered to be uh, negative from the perspective of e-commerce. And, um, and here this is really in a response to uh, finance ministers across the country uh, struggling with falling revenues uh, and increasing expenditures and having to look for, and also rising borrowing costs, and having to look for where they can get more financing and uh, you know, e-commerce or digital sectors emerging as potentially ripe for ex extracting more revenues from. Um, and so here, for instance, in a report, we cite uh, that uh, Cameroon uh, instituted a policy to increase the amount of taxes they were getting from telecom companies. Um, Kenya at the end of last year has instituted a digital services tax. Um, and I think mean, this is very understandable. Of course, finance ministers have to react to this. Uh, the, I think the suggestion that we have in our report is for them to be um, careful when they're doing this. Um, but, uh, the e-commerce sector in Africa is still in its infancy and perhaps needs to be nurtured uh, somewhat more. Uh, and also perhaps a, a recommendation here being maybe uh, beyond necessarily just increasing tax rates in that sector, also trying to address some of the legal tax avoidance that is present. That, you know, the e-commerce business models are quite easy to, to relocate the, where they are established to countries like Mauritius or others that have lower taxes and profits. Uh, and this is something that we know happens. So kind of addressing that kind of tax avoidance might be better at still enabling the actual local uh, players to grow and not crushing them with, with uh, heavy taxes while still increasing tax revenues. Um, and lastly, I want to share the finding that we were very impressed by, um, by the governments in the region and the private sector, which was the improved um, public-private dialogue uh, between the two. Um, and we noticed this in, for instance, many countries in North Africa, there was a lot of collaboration reported by many of those we interviewed uh, in Tunisia, Egypt, and Morocco, where um, 
uh, for instance, those involved in the delivery of goods, of food, uh, of logistics uh, in the tech sector worked with governments to uh, help uh, uh, reduce physical interaction between clients. Um, uh, in, in East Africa as well, we saw with Rwanda and, and Kenya, uh, even further encouragement of the adoption of cashless payments with mobile money, uh, with Safari Conference and some 12% increase in uh, customers there. And this, I think, shows the benefits uh, that um, the tech sector and government can have when they work together uh, to solve the challenges to the COVID crisis, but also, of course, beyond that to other challenges of economic development. But uh, thank you very much for the opportunity for this uh, opening remark. And thanks for the great report as well. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. And uh, I think what you confirm here is very much that, like in the Latin American case, there has been a setback in terms of overall uh, economic growth and so on, but actually uh, a leapfrogging, in a sense, of attention to e-commerce, and, and not only among the business sector, but also from at least selected governments. And I think the, the, what, what I learned from, from the, your assessment in Africa is that it's also similar to Latin America, that those governments that were already starting to move towards e-commerce and digitalization uh, were more quick also to take additional efforts to, to, uh, to adapt and, and, and try to mitigate the, the, the problems of, of the pandemic. And uh, so it's, it goes back a little bit to the readiness of countries as a whole and the business community to actually take advantage and deal with the challenges. Thank you so much. We will be back uh, soon again. Uh, let me now turn to another region, namely to the uh, UN Economic Commission for Europe, uh, which is, uh, is, uh, is uh, not a very good description of the sort of geographic coverage that you have, but I think you will mainly focus on certain parts of your regional scale. I'm very happy to have Elizabeth Turk, who is the Director of Economic Cooperation and Trade at UNECE, and I would like to give you the floor. Many thanks, Torbjörn. And uh, let me start by saying it's a great pleasure for me to be here in this event uh, with Ankhtan and the other regional commissions today and to be representing UNECE. As you just uh, mentioned, Torbjörn, our 56 uh, member countries, actually they span a region from uh, North America, Canada, over EU, EFTA countries in the south until Turkey and Israel and in the east until Central Asia, with the Southern Caucasus, Western Balkan in between. So we uh, were struggling a little bit in terms of how to approach uh, the analysis uh, for, for this project here today. Um, but it's been a very, very enriching uh, uh, exercise for us. And I'm, I'm happy to share some of the findings with you here today. Thank you, Thomas exactly is, is pulling up some slides. Now, um, uh, let me start by saying a few more words about uh, the UNECE region. And uh, what we have seen there really is that also in terms of e-commerce, the region is very diverse. So we have very advanced e-commerce markets, notably in Europe, in the US. We have e-commerce markets with great potential, like in the Russian Federation, Belarus, or also Turkey. And we have e-commerce markets that are relatively small in transition economies in Central Asia or the Caucasus, small e-commerce markets, but they are already uh, sort of growing and the crisis has definitely been an impetus here. Now, this digital divide that uh, separates regions um, also separates countries a little bit within these regions. And to give you just an example, if we look at Central Asia, we have there countries like Kazakhstan, they have internet connectivity of about 85%. And we have countries like Uzbekistan with an internet connectivity of 30%. So you can see there's really huge differences also within the region. And also important to note that in many countries, internet connectivity relies on, on mobile subscriptions. Now, obviously uh, with those differences, also the impact of the crisis and the response uh, to the crisis has been different. And what we have seen, and I guess that's no surprise, is that countries with robust digital connectivity they were much more successful in coping with the economic and social impact of the pandemic than those that were lagging behind in digital development. And there are, there are many reasons for why some countries were coping better than others, but digital readiness, and, and I think Torbjörn, you referred to the e-readiness assessments before, that definitely played a, a key role and we could see that also in our region. Now, what are the main impacts we, we have identified? And let me flag to you three of them. So first of all, overall, we've really seen an increase in online activity. We've seen an increase in online retail sales, in digital transactions. Secondly, we've seen that SMEs and MSMEs, they were very hard hit by the crisis, but they also turned to online activity for their survival. So that was sort of like part of their coping strategy. 
And thirdly, we have seen the trade facilitation, which is actually essential for e-commerce. Trade facilitation has been really facing challenges. And it was great for me to hear some of the previous speakers who already pointed to this trade facilitation dimension. Now, to all of these three findings, I should also put some, some caveats. And these are the data challenges mentioned by Shamika in the introduction. While e-commerce is really evolving rapidly, data, data on e-commerce is really scarce. And it's been a challenge for us to pull out some good data, to have some solid mapping. And maybe that's because we don't have a neutral single source. Maybe that's because we all have different understandings of what is the coverage of e-commerce. But data and uh, uh, has clearly been a challenge. Now, uh, let me say a few words about this impact number one, the increasing online activity. No surprise, I guess, that Europe and the US are, are leading here. We've seen digital adoption jump from 80 to 95% as a result of the COVID crisis in, in Europe. Uh, we have seen during the first quarter of 2020 that online orders went up by 50% in Europe. And we have seen in North America, if we look at the month of May 2020, the, the online orders actually, they have been up by 120%. So that's, that's really sort of like huge. And at the same time, it's not really a surprise because uh, in these countries, digital connectivity was there and businesses really sort of like used that to maintain their business operations and to improve their economic resilience. Let us now turn a little bit to some of the other regions and let us turn to, to Central Asia and the Caucasus. So what we see there is that already before the crisis, around 20% of the population in Central Asia, they used e-commerce in business to consumer transactions. But again, here we have huge differences and Kazakhstan, for example, is the largest B2C e-commerce market in Central Asia, followed by Azerbaijan. But then we also have countries where e-commerce is still at relatively like early stages, Tajikistan or Kyrgyz Republic or Turkmenistan. And there we have situations where internet penetration, for example, the rates there are below 50%. So if we look at Kazakhstan, the largest e-commerce market, it's growing at like more than 50% annually right now. And uh, if we look at the first half of 2020, Kazakhstan e-commerce market really presented some 10% some of the total retail trade in, in the country. Kazakhstan is followed by Azerbaijan, sort of like really the, the, the runner up. If we look at uh, Caucasus and Western Balkan, there we looked um, at uh, a World Bank a study, the World Bank Enterprise Survey. And that survey looked a little bit at like, the share of firms that started or increased their online business activities. And we have some pretty impressive numbers there. Moldova, it went up by 40%. Georgia, close to 37%. North Macedonia, 25%. Albania, close to 20%. So in sum, we see that a significant share of firms, they started or increased online business activity. And um, we have to bear in mind that a chunk of that obviously is, is sort of domestic. We tried to look a little bit at what is being traded, medical goods, groceries, household, household essentials and so forth, but also apparel, footwear, consumer electronics. And interesting, and I think uh, as another speaker has mentioned that before, we shouldn't forget services here, because in addition to trading goods, what we see is that uh, trade in online services has really increased. Again, maybe no surprise, because we all went digital in the past month. Now, let me add one more caveat, and uh, that is that we have seen in some countries in our region that sort of online activity is, is going back to normal. Why? Maybe because life has been going a little bit more back to normal, or maybe also because some of the countries, consumers really face challenges. So, um, uh, and, and they were a little bit more worried and maybe sort of like uh, disposable incomes also declined. Now, just briefly, uh, impact number two uh, is about MS, uh, SMEs and MSMEs, and they really went digital. That's maybe, uh, I think, again, something we could see across different regions. And impact number three is about trade facilitation. And, and that's really quite crucial because trade facilitation has an important impact on both businesses and uh, consumers for the efficiency of the delivery of, of all the physical goods that are being shipped. And uh, we could see that trade facilitation faced challenges. And uh, some of these challenges are really related to the crisis, 
cargo flights were not happening anymore. And some of these challenges uh, were already there before the crisis and have just been sort of like intensified or exacerbated uh, through the crisis poor infrastructure, for example, uh, lack of coordination between different uh, online systems and so forth are examples here. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to say quickly a few words about what are the responses we have seen. And here again, the caveat at the beginning, our study just provides a snapshot and it's very much anecdotal evidence. Um, but we have seen that the, the capacity of countries to respond is, is quite different. And uh, looking at the different responses that we found, I guess we can group them around a few entry points. And I would say the entry points are, first of all, enhancing ICT connectivity and infrastructure. Secondly, uh, improving financial inclusion. So putting in place the enabling environment for, for e-transactions and, and e-payments. And thirdly, enhancing digital skills of both consumers and, and businesses. And maybe that's something for the interactive debate. I, I guess those are really three concrete entry points. Also interesting, we've seen uh, sort of two cross-cutting features. One of them is that on many occasions, government response is really focused on SMEs yeah, and, and helped particularly that sector of the economy. And secondly, on many occasions, uh, government re responses focused on digital trade facilitation and e-government and sort of like uh, multimodal transport connectivity. So again, the trade facilitation and, and angle is quite important here. Real strategies, Kazakhstan, uh, one, one of the countries, having developed a whole five-year plan to develop e-commerce infrastructure with a focus on, on SMEs. But we have also seen concrete activities in, in Kyrgyzstan, for example. Um, they are, uh, the Electronic Commerce Association, they, they set up a website, something very practical. They set up a website with a list of online stores and that facilitated greatly activities during quarantine. And uh, the government also supported SMEs through VIT exceptions and uh, sort of like tax deferrals. And if we turn to another country, Armenia, for example, they have also put in place uh, quite a, a large number of measures to, to assist SMEs during the crisis. Again, subsidies, preferential loans, and so forth. So I guess I leave it with that. In the UNECE region, very differentiated impact, but some cross-cutting features are emerging. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Lisi. And uh, uh, we look forward also to seeing the actual report, uh, which I, I know is in the, in the making and uh, hopefully will be out soon. Uh, we'll get back to some of the policy issues in interaction very shortly. Let me now turn to the final regional commission, uh, which is the uh, ESQA for uh, Western Asia, or I think mainly in this context for the Arab region. And uh, to help us with the presenting the results from that region, I have Mr. Ayman El Sharbini, who is the chief of the ICT policy section. So please Ayman, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, dear Torbjorn, and uh, thanks uh, to uh, UNCTAD for this very uh, uh, rich and enriching uh, partnership that we had together. I'll just put a few slides on and uh, then we proceed. So can you see the slides now? Okay, so uh, this uh, the topic uh, is very interesting to us because it is part of many studies uh, that we have done uh, uh, during the uh, response and recovery phases of uh, the uh, pandemic. And uh, the topic on e-commerce is uh, very uh, relevant and uh, we uh, are uh, uh, intending very soon to launch the Arab regional report. Uh, uh, last uh, Saturday, we contribute to the event by ECA, and we hope that uh, you also uh, will be ha uh, having the opportunity to join us in the Arab launch. So in this uh, presentation, I will not give a lot about uh, the Arab uh, specificities, but I will try to tweak the discussion to what uh, is relevant uh, to the panel. So uh, as we know that the COVID has hit hard with uh, like 50 million cases uh, end of October, and that the pandemic has lost the global economic uh, situation politically and socially uh, in a very uh, tr troublesome mode. Uh, 
uh, in fact, uh, part of the, let us say, the benefits of the pandemic is shifting consumer preferences uh, towards online shopping uh, and distancing uh, has uh, like compelled them to uh, try really that uh, tasting the digital transformation. In, in the global market, uh, the, I think Shamika had presented uh, uh, some slides on the global situation. Uh, regarding the e-commerce market. And uh, generally speaking, I want just to say that in our region, we are still lagging a lot uh, regarding e-commerce, but uh, we, uh, we will see at the end of the slides how much impact uh, positively has it, uh, luckily, if we may, affected the consumer uh, behaviors. So we see only here uh, the, the leading uh, regions, Asia Pacific, North America, uh, Western Europe and, uh, uh, of course, the natural suspects, China, US, UK, Japan, and Germany. But uh, when we go to the Arab region, we see that uh, despite it is of a small magnitude, but it's still witnessing a, dr a dramatic dynamic growth, especially after the outbreak. And the potential is there for that rapid transformation uh, because of many enabling factors, the positive side, which is the increasing level of uh, awareness that happened during the last year and also the gross opportunities uh, that uh, has been proven for the small uh, and large retailers. Uh, furthermore, the infrastructure and affordability is in good shape uh, relatively in the region. So uh, the regional benchmarking shows that there is uh, such kind of room for, uh, for massive growth in the Arab region, uh, despite the low penetration. But uh, the point now is uh, the most areas that has been impacted hardly during this pandemic, we know it is uh, the airports and the shipment and cross-border uh, trade was heavily, uh, of course, affected as the, some of the colleagues have also witnessed in their exercise. Uh, uh, and uh, not only that, but even the, the normal flight passenger movement, uh, the maritime and uh, uh, the container shipping industry. So uh, on the other side, the, the countries did not stand still uh, idle with that kind of uh, crisis. And to mitigate these uh, restrictions on, on the essential delivery of goods and flows, there has been some kind of measures. The first slide here on, uh, related to the trade facilitation measures uh, during the lockdown, for example, we see uh, three examples here. Qatar, for example, exempted the food and medical goods from custom duties for six months. The Bahrain also urged all its clients to pay the custom taxes and fees through e-payment. And this is just an illustration, but it is also in many other countries. Oman began providing remote custom clearance service by not requiring physical presence for the customs during the inspections. So these are trade facilitation related. Let us see more general kind of uh, responses that took place in the country, countries of the region. Let us uh, look at Bahrain telecom sector, for example, which has been uh, instrumental in combating this uh, crisis. Uh, the TRA launched many initiatives to operators, urging them uh, to uh, provide uh, support uh, through uh, telecom measures. Iraq increased the internet capacities. Kuwait uh, also provided additional services regarding cybersecurity. Egypt and its NTRA worked together for e-transactions uh, and increased e-payments. Even the subsidies were paid in a very quick and smart way through bank, uh, uh, banking partnerships uh, with the telecoms. Jordan developed platforms and so on and so forth. We have Lebanon, we have also Oman, Saudi Arabia. Uh, the study that will be launched end of April will show also uh, Qatar and Sudan. So there's a lot of these kind of initiatives. The best thing that the financial inclusion has been drastically, uh, suddenly, all of a sudden, been the top of the agenda, uh, as well as the FinTech became uh, the most user-friendly thing for even the farmers and the uh, uh, blue collars. And uh, the other thing related to the behavior, we did uh, also a survey uh, 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 on our own, I will show it in a short while, but this uh, for, is data from Statista online survey, shows that uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic situation have positively affected the e-commerce activities in the Arab states with a notable change on the consumer behaviors. 
uh, when we uh, like uh, look at Saudi Arabia, for example, we see that about 50% of the respondents said they will use e-commerce more after uh, the pandemic, and they will use it more frequently. They used it more than they used to do it before. Egypt said the same. We used 47% uh, more frequently, Jordan, Emirates, and Lebanon. And uh, if we look now on uh, the last slide, and this is a reminder, seven and last slide for Bjorn. So uh, we, we did an interview, a secondary, uh, a primary sort of a data because we had also a mixed approach in the research. And we found out that uh, the interviewees were asked to determine the barriers that uh, are circumventing or uh, representing hurdles for the proliferation of e-commerce. And uh, they listed a lot of uh, reasons. Uh, it was qualitative, of course. And we found out that uh, cultural barriers, infrastructure, legal and regulatory e-commerce, and so on, is still among the, the rooms for improvement. And uh, we will give more details uh, in the section related to question answers on different types of barriers, be it economic, regulatory, technical, or industry readiness oriented. By this, I conclude this segment and uh, looking forward to the less, uh, next part of uh, the session. Thank you, Torbjorn, and thanks to Unctad once again. Thank you very much, Eamon. Uh, and I, I know that the, uh, the Esquire report for, on this topic will become extremely interesting as well. And I think it will serve very timely for your overall work at the region to improve the digital economy uh, of the Arab countries. Uh, so, and we are very uh, proud and happy to be part of that process as well. So, thank you, Eamon. Now, I will turn out to, um, uh, to the last uh, panelist here, uh, who is not representing a particular region, but is uh, one of our trusted, most trusted partners in the E-Trade for All uh, context, namely the International Trade Center. And uh, even more that, uh, Mr. James Howe, who is the Senior Advisor on E-Commerce in ITC. Uh, and I know that uh, a lot of people are here have already stressed a lot about the small and micro and small uh, medium sized businesses and that have been very much affected by this uh, pandemic. And I'm looking forward to hearing ITC's perspective on this. And I know that you have some, some uh, video surprises for us. Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks Torby. And, and thank you uh, regional colleagues in uh, the UN system for this uh, insightful overview of the, um, the policy, economic, and uh, the situation, uh, as, as you've seen it, as it's unrolled with COVID and e-commerce. E we wanted to complement this a little bit and, ch and change the, uh, uh, the messaging to, to give the voice to small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, in the course of our work, despite the obvious um, economic uh, difficulties encountered. We, we, we've also encountered examples of, of, of uh, entrepreneurial resilience and even optimism as we've, we've spoken to people around the world. Um, a particular example is Nikaha. The, the, the video here is showing something about that. Is a maker of handmade traditional hats in Nicaragua. Uh, the owner of the company and the women she, she worked with were supported in making their first e-commerce site in a timely manner at the beginning of the year. And they actually credit this just in time. Of course, nobody knew the pandemic was coming for them not only to survive 2020, uh, which but they also increased their sales over 2019. So it's just a little example of, of, of what's been changing the optimism this has caused. Um, we did a survey at the, the peak of um, uh, uh, the lockdown uh, last summer and found that one in four uh, SMEs um, um, were, were, had switched to doing e-commerce as a result of the, uh, the, the pandemic. And among the majority who weren't doing it, among the remainder who weren't doing e-commerce, over 90% had plans to do so. So really we've seen a switch. As we've heard, this has become part of the new normal and the means of surviving. So, um, we wanted to learn from some, some voices from these small companies about what, what these issues that we've all been talking about in the different regions, how it's felt for them. Uh, they announced some of the well-known difficulties, uh, things like logistics, the problems of logistics, in particular, the problems of payments. 
but also understanding and matching demand of different markets. So I'll stop there. I'll let them speak in the form of a video. So just a warning about the sound of this. The sound is not great. We recorded this especially for this over Zoom. The sound is a bit mixed quality. So do try and listen or turn up your volume to hear this. And I would also like to draw the attention for the initiative taken by the Cambodian government to speed up the implementation of the e-commerce strategy in Cambodia. If we go through the good practice guidelines, which is segregated in so many different forms that even anybody can go through those guidelines and check how they can be a vendor or how they can be a seller or how they can be useful, uh, how e-commerce can be useful them as a seller or as a buyer. Uh, some vendors are not very educated about how to come and sell their products on an e-commerce platform. So giving them those guidelines j'ai eu aussi la chance de profiter d'un autre programme qui, qui a financé des sites de e-commerce pour une vingtaine d'artisans à Tunisie. So if I pick one database that has helped us is the Export Development Board of Sri Lanka's database. What we look for in there is cross-border opportunities for e-commerce. Like for example, I can find out what kind of Sri Lankan tea is exported to Walmart um, in the US. And if Walmart is buying, that means there is consumer demand in the US for that Sri Lankan tea. So I'm going to go and sell Sri Lankan tea on Amazon. And, um, we improve on getting um, new uh, um, internet suppliers. Um, so then uh, we also gave them viva, such as um, um, passports. So um, there is always a risk of experiencing technical problems uh, with internet connectivity in, in our um, area. So we, we are having a lot of challenges in PayPal because once the amount goes over a certain amount, then the limit goes out. Then we ask for but there were many different delivery companies who helped during that time so we had to try up with different delivery companies or different e-commerce companies who were doing the logistic support so we just came close to each other and helped each other during that pandemic time we had no issues with it the way we were going on as usual only when we started shipping our masks to eBay to within the local food food system, they had said that they would be shipping in the whole month of July and we start with August. But August came and I told them and they said, no, maybe another two weeks and not sure. Their rates are like three times the amount that they just started. Yeah, especially in continental beach where they are going back. We do live in it so uh, but we want to ensure that indeed if you take the all the challenges we can be up. Uh yeah vraiment a travail de sensibilisation par rapport au droit du consommateur uh par rapport à la protection et la sécurité des données uh bancaires. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Okay, so thanks for that. Thanks for the time. I can answer any questions. We can come back to that, but that's my seven minutes done. <laughs> thank you, James. And thank you for making all this effort to collect these voices from, from people really on the front line uh, of coping with the pandemic from, from an e-commerce perspective. Um, we, the, there is a common challenge to this kind of uh, events, and that is that time runs much faster than, than you hope that it will. Uh, I would like to uh, just uh, put one question to uh, all our panelists now. Uh, and uh, we, we know the situation. Uh, uh, you've given us a good description of where we stand in terms of the barriers and some of the responses that we have seen. And I would like to ask each and one of you and, and try to be very succinct in your responses. Of course, we are still in the midst of the pandemic and it's still hitting hard in, in a number of countries around the world, including here in Europe. Uh, I would like to ask you to, to just comment upon what policies and strategies at this point in time and perhaps looking ahead, do you see as the most important to uh, help e-commerce play as a constructive and productive role for the long-term response and recovery around the world. And I will focus on uh, each of you representing um, a, a particular region. So let me first start by asking Nano if you could uh, give your, uh, your take on this question. Robert, thanks for this uh, very important question. I think moving forward for uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, probably the most uh, important area is to improve their e-readiness of small and medium-sized enterprises, because we've seen that this is one of the major challenges that, um, as we've seen in, several, in previous presentations, that, um, and also what highlighted by James, is that many businesses are simply not prepared uh, to, to move online. So uh, what needs to be stepped up is uh, the digital transformation of SMEs, and um, governments can, can help in this process. And also, of course, they're very important uh, international actors and also uh, private um, <clears throat> firms who can, um, who can support this work. For example, yesterday I participated in a webinar by uh, UPC, who has a special program to um, promote the participation of uh, female-led um, SMEs in e-commerce. So this, that's just one, of, one example. And uh, for the sake of time, I would like to stop with this example. And maybe you can ask Sandra as well to have, get a view from the IDB on this. Sure. Sandra, what would you like to add on this one? Thank you very much. Uh, I will say that, um, uh, uh, that it will be very important uh, uh, to, to have a better data. Uh, I know that this is not a policy response, but I also know that uh, this is very uh, necessary in order to uh, make uh, better uh, policy responses. So I will just uh, mention that, that uh, uh, we should uh, find a, a way to, uh, uh, to have consistent and reliable uh, data, especially for uh, cross-border uh, e-commerce, and also uh, to work closely with, uh, with the private sector um, as well. Thank you. Thank you. This is a, such an important point because uh, it became very clear, even clearer than we had expected, that the lack of data is a big challenge, especially when you try to do an assessment in real time uh, as things are happening. The latest uh, global estimates of e-commerce that we will be able to produce uh, later in April will only be covering up to 2019. Of course, we will try to look also at other at the data sources to, to get a feel for what's happening. But this statistical issue is extremely important. Thank you for pointing that out, Sandra. Uh, let me turn to uh, Jamie. What would you uh, like to stress in this context? Uh, I, thank you very much. Uh, I think for me, uh, and seeing this very briefly, it's uh, again, addressing the foundations for the digital economy in Africa. And here, I think there's three data points that I think emphasize this. Uh, one, that only 30% of Africans are currently online now. Two, that only 4% of them have uh, credit cards. Uh, and three, that only 16% of Africans can actually at the moment receive mail at home. So trying to improve these foundations is really important. I think there, the answers are things uh, like uh, improving the competition in the um, uh, telecoms kind of market for, for, for internet access, 
Uh, so for instance, in our study, we point out that uh, um, so 13 African countries uh, have uh, either partially competitive or fully monopolistic uh, um, internet service providing markets, and only 28 African countries currently have competition authorities to really ensure that they reduce prices, behave competitively, things like that. Uh, for the, the credit cards, I think the answer in the African context is mobile money. And again, there, it's like ensuring that uh, telecoms have uh, mobile money licenses to introduce those products and compete with banks. Um, and uh, however, I want to say, though, in addition to that, these help the foundations really for the consumption of e-commerce. Um, uh, but really for Africa, we need there to be the creation of value. And there, I think it's also an investment in digital skills. Uh, currently, this can be uh, quite lacking. Um, most of those you know, um, coders, for instance, uh, here will be less formally trained. Uh, I, I don't often express as you're more like hackers and kind of uh, finding a way to, to take those foundational skills uh, and develop them can be very important for helping African SMEs to create value uh, mm. as well as being consumers. Mm. But before uh, leaving you, Jamie, could you also, because I have, I've heard some references to this and I've also seen that there are some questions in the, in the, in the Q and A uh, channel. Uh, what, how important is the African continental free trade area in this contest as we moving forward? What's your assessment of that? Yeah, that's a, a really interesting question. Uh, and to some extent, it depends on how ambitious governments want to be with the e-commerce protocol and uh, negotiations for which uh, will start later this year. In some of our research that we did in this area, we asked uh, businesses across the continent what would be helpful for them in that. And the kind of things they told us were things to help address cross-border tax issues they're facing, harmonizing the kind of regulations they're facing across borders in areas like cybersecurity, uh, data protection, uh, consumer protection, uh, and uh, additionally, uh, trying to improve trust when it comes to cross-border transactions. And that also relates to the consumer protection uh, uh, kind of uh, aspects. Okay, that's very helpful. And uh, we're very interested in seeing how this will evolve now in the coming months and years and uh, uh, we're happy to be part of the journey here. Uh, Lissy, let's bring in your perspective here. How to set priorities in this case? Thank you very much, Torbjörn. And uh, let me pick up, I think in your question you said uh, how to ensure inclusivity. So let me make a few remarks about inclusivity and, and also sustainability. Yeah? My strategies would be the following. Firstly, uh, supporting the SMEs. And that includes support on the financial side, on the infrastructure side, and on the skills side. And I think here we've heard that also from many other speakers. Secondly, when, when talking about inclusivity, um, let me mention the gender dimension. And so I, I think it's important to address the digital gender divide. And again, both in terms of access to digital interactions and in terms of skills. So second is gender. And third, I'd love to flag sustainability. Yeah? Uh, in UNECE, we are now really focusing on the circular economy, how to reduce resource use. And here again, e-commerce and the sharing economy and digital platforms can have a key role to play. So I would add circularity and sustainability as strategy number three. All of that to be underpinned with trade facilitation, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I know trade facilitation is always high up on the agenda of UNEC, which is, well, it's important. It's been stressed by a number of speakers here, so there's no doubt that it's very relevant. Uh, okay, uh, Eamon, uh, how does the priority setting look like from, the, from your region? Okay, thank you so much once again. This is a very interesting question. In fact, um, the question uh, relates to the wider context of our uh, regional uh, focus now on the digital economy, boosting digital economy, creating uh, this, uh, let us say, cons conceptual uh, uh, paradigm shift uh, from uh, consumption to production and also from import to export. Uh, also, the, uh, let, let us say, the support of the digital trade in all its dimensions. This is really uh, the main uh, challenge in the policy at the policy level uh, that uh, my previous speakers have mentioned, including uh, solving the barriers related to data, re research data, comparative data on the one hand, and furthermore, also solving uh, the e-commerce, uh, let us say, dilemma at two levels, at the national level and at the regional level. At the national level, there is no doubt that this is uh, now uh, uh, an uh, there is an opportunity and a quick win 
in that uh, sub uh, national sphere. Uh, so let us, uh, like uh, in the region, move quickly with supporting the SMEs, uh, giving them the tools, uh, and also facilitating the inter uh, internal national trade, uh, because this is in the circle of influence of, of each government. And there is a lot to, to be said on that regarding the sectoral collaboration between the telecommunication sector, the banking sector, and uh, uh, the uh, innovation community. But uh, when it comes to the regional level, which is also a priority in the region, we have to see it uh, really uh, uh, as uh, uh, a, a low hanging fruit, but it will need some kind of cooking. And that cooking is like working within the regional uh, platforms to uh, solve the trade barriers in general, first of all, and then solve the e-commerce trade barriers. Uh, including harmonization of the e-commerce, data privacy, data protection across uh, uh, the countries, as well as harmonizing the taxation uh, and uh, the rest of the cross-border issues. So generally speaking, we have the, really now the intention to create this uh, paradigm shift and momentum. You have worked with us yesterday uh, in the Arab Digital Agenda project uh, and in the digital economy, cross-collaboration inside and also coherence across borders and uh, uh, at the data and policy levels. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ayman. I think it should be clear from the, from the various uh, interventions that we have heard that the barriers and, uh, and challenges that the countries and, and businesses are facing, they span a wide range of policy areas from infrastructure connectivity, from a, a holistic approach by governments, skills, payments, and so on and so forth. And I'd like to turn now to James, and ask you specifically from the perspective of all these challenges facing uh, member states and especially the least developed countries, how do you see the role of the international community to contribute better in this context, to close in the digital gaps that we have and mitigating further digital inequalities in the recovery phase? And maybe I can just add on to that if you can also reflect in this context, what role aid for trade uh, in the WTO can play, and maybe also E-Trade for all in this context. All right, Simon. thank you. It's a very broad question. Uh, I think my response would go in a direction that I suspect you would approve of, say the, the challenge for us is to be working together, connecting the dots, if you like, in a different way. Um, and we see lots of good examples about this. Again, I think we've been spurred to work be better together as international organizations over the last year. I think three big challenges, those of, uh, if I put them in big bucket, you know, connectivity, upgrading ecosystems, and I mean that in a way of, you know, shared facilities, shared access to tools and solutions which can overcome these problems. And the third broad one, I'd say, you know, understanding skills and training, all have some solutions with, um, you know, improved working together in partnerships. There are innovative partnerships about delivering connectivity, new business models to support that. Uh, there is um, innovative things about, uh, delivering sh shared and improved access to support. And, you know, I point to this area of understanding. It was interesting, a colleague from Esquire, one of the slide number I picked up, was saying 71% cultural barriers. That was interesting. The top and the next nearest barrier um, that I saw on, certainly I know it's only one region and one survey, but it's indicative of something. Uh, infrastructure was 30 points behind. We tend to go on about infrastructure a lot. But something under that big agenda of cultural barriers, understanding languages, appropriate skills, looks to be a big thing. So issues that can uh, address those skill gaps in various different ways, I think, become uh, more than important. Thanks a lot, uh, James. Yes, working together is, uh, is part of the, the challenge of connecting the dots here. Now, I'd like to... Uh, invite uh, Mr. Budi Prasad Upadaya, who is the councillor and deputy permanent representative of the permanent mission of Nepal here in Geneva. Uh, I, I'd like to ask you to share a few remarks from your perspective, from Nepal, Nepal who is one of the least developed countries. How, have, how has your country adapted to the early stages of the pandemic? And, and are there any lessons that you can share with us so far? Budi, you have the floor. Thank you, moderator, for giving me the flow. At the outset, let me thank the UNCTAD for providing me this opportunity and all presenters for their insightful presentation. 
I wish to share my views in three as aspects. The first, some basis for e-commerce in Nepal. As you know, e-commerce has created a new platform for faster economic development of Nepal. Various policy and legal arrangements that we have, have created a good base. The government adopted an e-commerce national strategy in 2019 with a vision of expansion of trade and creation of technology-friendly economy through e-commerce, which is a major shift towards e-commerce. Nepal, Nepal's recent notification of shifting 11 measures from the existing category C to category B is an indication of early implementation of the trade facilitation agreement, which has been much discussed in this forum as well. During the pandemic, the government drafted an e-commerce related bill to facilitate, regulate and promote e-commerce in Nepal. Second, let me turn to the major responses of the government at the early stage of the pandemic. The Deputy Prime Minister led COVID-19 Crisis Management Center remained fully operational to manage all interventions against the COVID-19. First, tracking, tracing and testing and then quarantine, isolation and treatment were applied. Countrywide lockdown and close of business at the beginning was compulsion of all, including Nepal. Shop, shops of essential goods were allowed to open in certain time every day for smooth supply. Monitoring of stocks and production of essential goods were carried out to, at all level to maintain smooth supply chain. Customs clearance further expedited for relief goods and essential medical items and customs duty exempted. Ease of border processing further improved by accepting soft copies of documents and by holding virtual consultation at regional as well as bilateral level. A quick response team remained operational 24 hours. Online estate, uh, online sales, e-commerce, mobile van trade, online platform initiative for MSMEs and door-to-door -door sale among others were introduced and encouraged. Now, let me turn to the third aspect. I would like to share some lessons. We realized that data system is the most important to effectively manage any crisis. And then preparedness forever is also equally important. Digitalization and green development approach in partnership with private sector, investment in social infrastructure and community empowerment are also important. Technology transfer, digital transformation, partnership for innovation and technological capacity building would be much appreciated. Adoption of policy measures at global level to ensure institutional and human capacity building of LDCs and LLDCs with well-equipped ICT infrastructure and then just benefit of e-commerce to all through adequate taxation system in digital economy and other are also needed. Such policies need to be translated into action and resolved by localizing supports from development partners. Some supportive policies and programs at country level such as incentivizing innovative business, providing sufficient infrastructure and other enabling environment are also important. In our experience, digitalizing cross-border trade is not sufficient and therefore we need to enable for going digital at local and individual level by strengthening development of IT technology, data security, trade logistics, and trade facilitation system, linking the recovery with achieving SDGs and LDC graduation needed. Finally, year 2020 changed many things, including our lifestyle and business style, shifting from physical to virtual and then again through virtual to global. I wish to thank Angtad for leading the E-Trade for All initiative and helping us bridge the knowledge gap on e-commerce information and resources and catalyze partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much, Budi, for that uh, very insightful comment and uh, appreciate also your kind words about Angtad and the E-Trade for All initiative as a whole. Very much appreciated. Uh, time is running out, but I would like to uh, give uh, the panelists uh, an opportunity to give a final thought, 
final comment. And I would like to, if possible, that you can try to address the question of how can you, in your organization, help countries in your region that are trailing behind in the opportunities to um, uh, benefit and take advantage of e-commerce and digital economy. Uh, what are the most important actions that you can offer uh, from your uh, platform to these countries? And uh, let me start by giving the floor to Nano. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I would like to congratulate again UMTAT and all the E-Trade for All partners that participated in this collaborative effort, uh, which we're seeing the fruits of today. Uh, to answer your question very shortly, I think uh, e-commerce has presented a great opportunity, presents a great opportunity for, um, for businesses and consumers to thrive, to overcome uh, many of the impediments of the, uh, of the pandemic that has shown to us. But uh, we need to work very closely together, both the in, um, public sector, private sector, and international organizations to make sure that it doesn't lead to a greater divide. So in that sense, um, what we will do from uh, ECLAC and certainly IDB as well, is work together with governments and private stakeholders to make sure that uh, the ones that are most left behind in e-commerce uh, can be able to participate. So to make sure that SMEs can connect, that uh, consumers can also engage in e-commerce, that postal systems are uh, improve their services, that people will be able to make payments. Um, uh, just to mention a few of the initiatives we would like to work on for the next couple of years. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Can you tell me how best IDB can contribute in this context? Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for, for UNTAC and for uh, uh, E-Trade for All for the opportunity. Um, the IDB is working closely, uh, as I mentioned, with the uh, uh, governments and with both at national and also regional level, and working closely with uh, other institutions to provide uh, assistance, technical assistance and financial assistance and for them to, to build uh, uh, an e-strategy uh, on, 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 on e-commerce. But just to finalize, I think that this strategy on e-commerce uh, should be uh, multi-dimensional, should be inclusive, should be in not innovative with uh, new technologies based on regional uh, cooperation. I think that's very important. Collaborative with the private sector. And I think that uh, it should be also environmentally uh, friendly. Uh, this hasn't been mentioned, but I think this is very important, especially on uh, uh, the last uh, mile uh, of distribution for e-commerce. E we should make efforts uh, for uh, uh, be uh, uh, as environmentally as, as possible. Thank you very much. Very important point, and we'll definitely reach out to you also bilaterally to see how we can perhaps collaborate on, on helping countries develop their national e-commerce strategies here. Um, Jamie, how can ECA help out? Yes, uh, good question. Um, for us, I think uh, there's many areas we can. Uh, the one I'd focus on is the negotiations on the AFCFTA, the African Continental Free Trade Area, which as we mentioned, because uh, us at UNECA, along with UNCTAD actually, are the two technical partners to those negotiations. We have a responsibility to, to help negotiators with inputs to that, to provide them with valid research and options and what they can do uh, in those negotiations. So when the e-commerce negotiations uh, commence this year, uh, and we've already been working on this, we want to have in place uh, good research for the negotiators to draw from, as well as that uh, capacity building uh, uh, opportunities for negotiators, particularly those from uh, countries that may not uh, be as exposed to these negotiating topics, or maybe who, who want to develop their, their, their knowledge and awareness uh, in this area. Uh, so for us, I think at the moment, that's uh, one of the most relevant ones. Thank you so much, Jamie, and thanks for joining today. Uh, Lizzie, what can UNEC do? Thank you very much. Well, UNECE has a very strong normative role, particularly in, in the trade facilitation area, that's UNC fact. So I would think our key contribution is here by uh, developing these harmonized business standards, including for, for e-business, and also recommendations such as a single window and tools to sort of like turn border crossings more digital. At the same point, um, at the same time, and, and that's point number two, I, I do believe that uh, data and research and sharing of experiences is really important. So the exercise we are undergoing here uh, really is essential and, and I would suggest we do more of that. Thirdly, 
regional integration matters. And we see different sub-regions also in our region. We are supporting some of these sub-regions in the context of Central Asia, SPECA, for example, to, to get their strategies up and going. And last but not least, um, joining hands in an initiative like uh, here today and, and the Anktat E-Trade initiative, that's, that's definitely something very valuable where we can all contribute with our different backgrounds and, and different mandates. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lizzie. It's been a pleasure to work with UNEC in this project. Uh, Eamon, please, your take on this. Okay, Th thank you so much. Uh, I'm happy to share the, some of the final remarks. Uh, the final remarks is uh, really collaboration and collaboration uh, and digital cooperation. So within uh, the UN Secretary General uh, Global Roadmap on uh, digital cooperation, we can find many of uh, the, let us say, the umbrella things that can bring us more close together, I suggest uh, that uh, we build on our success, uh, all of us, our success in this initiative uh, su suggested by colleagues in ACLAC, led by UNCTAD, and uh, come together in 2021, working now not on the impact and the response and the recovery, but now on the Building Back Better uh, joint project. We will can talk uh, to you about that next week and with the colleagues. You are the best situated to do that. Uh, in parallel, we continue supporting your role in the region in the E-Trade uh, assessments, readiness assessments, as well as uh, we are going to also suggest uh, to our uh, uh, regional partners uh, uh, through our partnership with the League of Arab States to work um, and specifically on the national e-commerce strategies because we have this kind of modular approach to the Arab Digital Agenda. And the module on the uh, ICT strategy is as important as a module on the e-commerce strategy at the national level. So our hands with you on that. And uh, we really believe in the opportunity and we think that it cannot be uh, better to build back better. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eamon. Uh, final word also from, from James, uh, from ITC. Well, very quickly, I shouldn't really have the last word. Um, but uh, building and leveraging networks, both online and offline. Example online, the Ecom Connect Network, which joins together entrepreneurs, small businesses, and I think is an example of, with local chapters of entrepreneurs learning from one another. We see new power of this in the digital age. Entrepreneurs are really hungry to learn from one another. People have really done it. I think we all need to up our game about you know, finding these stories, finding these leaders, and giving them the power of tool, tools to help their, their peers. There you are, in a word, I'll stop. Thank you so much, James. And uh, just to conclude, I think uh, I, you have now had an opportunity to meet some of the really great partners of E-Trade for All uh, in this uh, one, and a hour, one and a half hour session of E-Trade for All, but there are many more. Uh, I would encourage you to visit the etradeforall.org website to get to know many of the other partners that have not been speaking today. Uh, and of course, some of our uh, privileged partners there are WTO and the Enhanced Integrated Framework that are very much involved in the organization of this Aid for Trade stock taking event. Uh, I would also uh, like to recognize the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung that, uh, and their office in Geneva that have helped us uh, with some of the reports uh, for this mega effort to uh, develop the COVID analysis on e-commerce. Thank you very much for attending this E-Trade for All event session. As you leave the webinar, you will see a short post webinar survey that we invite you to participate in to share with us your experience today. We wish you a very good morning, a very good afternoon, a very good evening, or even good night, wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you.